You are listening to the fourth segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Susan Weed. Susan is an American herbalist and director of the Wise Women's Center located near Woodstock, New York. She is known for her writing and teaching of what she describes as the Wise Women Way of Herbalism. Susan is the author of five books and a contributor to the Ratledge International Encyclopedia of Women's Studies and writes a regular column in Sage Woman and for Awakened Woman Online. You can learn more about Susan by visiting SusanWeed.com. Hello, Susan. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia. This week, we're going to wrap up our segment on the three traditions of healing. And tonight, you're going to discuss the wise woman tradition with us. Yes, we save the best till last. (laughs) The three traditions of healing. A scientific tradition, which is linear, which measures and fixes the heroic tradition, which is circular, sometimes three circles, for body, mind, and spirit, which blames us and shames us and tells us we better clean those toxins out of our bodies. In the heroic tradition, the troubled one says, I've been bad and I need someone to punish me, and the healer says, I will save you. Do as I say do. In the wise woman tradition, the troubled one says, I am seeking support so that I can let go to my depths and become more whole. And the healer says, I will play with you in the sacred garden. Very different kinds of things. Neither one of these is orthodox modern medicine. And you're more likely, if you go looking for an alternative, to find the heroic tradition. But since I've been out there teaching for a great number of decades, there are more and more people in the wise woman tradition. And of course, having written five books, uh, looking through this worldview of the wise woman tradition and dealing with specific healing issues, there is quite a huge variety of material available to you to help you begin to work in the wise woman way. The Emotion here is not the fear of the scientific tradition or the blame and shame of the heroic tradition, but self-love, self-respect, and compassion, compassion for ourselves. We remember that the scientific tradition says the whole is exactly the same as its parts. And the heroic tradition says the whole is the sum of its parts, body, mind, and spirit. But the wise woman tradition says that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. That you can take something apart and you have lost an invisible, unmeasurable thing that won't be there when you put it back together again. The wise woman tradition is the oldest healing tradition on this planet. It goes back at least 30,000 years. Some sources claim that it goes back a quarter of a million years. The wise woman tradition is rarely identified or talked about because it is invisible. It is, in fact, that invisible thing that disappears when we pull something apart into its constituent pieces. There are some pretty specific reasons that the wise woman tradition is invisible. First of all, nourishing is an invisible process. We remember that the scientific tradition fixes, the heroic tradition cleanses, and the wise woman tradition nourishes. And 
Nourishment is just something that goes on, moment by moment, meal by meal, day by day, week, month, year after year of our lives. Nourishment is there, and so it becomes somewhat invisible. My little 30-second rant of the year is this new term called functional food. Now, the truth of the matter is that all real food is functional food. Kasha is great for the heart and, you know, I could just go right through it and take it, you know, the health benefits. Cabbage is a fantastic healer. Pomegranate protects the prostate. Da 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 da. Any real food is a functional food. It functions in the body. It doesn't just give you nutrition. That's the, that's the definition of a functional food. Something that has a function in the body besides nutrition. Whoa! Wait a second. If all foods are functional foods, why do we even have to have this idea? It's because people are now eating food that isn't functional. Yeah, it's because people are now eating stuff that isn't even food anymore. So maybe we need to make nourishment a little more visible so that we start looking at what we're eating and seeing how important that is. Who primarily nourishes? That's right, mama, mother. Mare, in the ocean, the sea, Mary, Maria, Mama, it is the mother. The World Health Organization says 80% of all health care offered at any given day on this planet is offered by mothers in their own homes using plants that grow locally. The wise woman tradition is still the most common tradition of healing, even though we rarely hear about it because it is invisible. It just is what we do. We don't need to have schools or licenses or awards. We simply are the women who know that nourishing and healing are sacred responsibility. Now, when I say that 80% of the health care given on any day in this planet is given by women in their houses, if you immediately think that's probably not the white women, you're right. And so we have another reason for invisibility, don't we? Women, especially women of color, are invisible to white men and white male society. Think back to pictures in National Geographic in the 50s, okay? Darkest Africa. And here is the witch doctor in Darkest Africa. He's a man, and how is he dressed? He's got on a skirt and coconut shells for breasts. Yes, indeed. That's why he's the witch doctor, the woman doctor everywhere around the The planet Aboriginal people understand that all women are healers and that any man who wishes to be a healer has only one task that he must complete in order to be a healer, and that is he must find his womb. He must find his female self. Now, Carl Jung of modern times would have it that we are all half that women have a male half and men have a woman half, but science does not back that up. If you actually look genetically, you will find that every single one of my cells as a woman is X. X, that means woman, woman. I am woman squared. I am woman prime. I am woman doubled. And there is no male part of me. Whereas men and every single one of their cells have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Y is the male chromosome and X is the, yeah, you're right, the female chromosome. And that means that every man does have a woman within him that he needs to find to honor and to become conversant with. And so, all around the world from culture culture from the cold to the heat, from the dry to the wet. Every culture has said, man, if you want to be a healer, show us your womb, show us your womanness, 
show us your right to heal by becoming a woman, and no woman ever had to do anything to become a healer because she just already is. Women healers, midwives, and herbalists are often written out of accounts, omitted when lists are recopied, known only by a husband's name. And needless to say, the lineage of the European wise woman tradition went up in flames. Why is the wise woman tradition invisible? Because a woman making dinner is invisible. To claim that she is engaged in healing her family and community and keeping her universe healthy is a lot to claim for dinner. But we do. Spoken words are invisible, and the wise woman tradition is an oral tradition. It is a tradition that is passed down by experience rather than dogma, with creativity rather than fixity, from many unique individuals rather than from a monolithic tradition. The wise woman way is non-repeatable, non-replicable, ever-changing and ever-mutable, for it focuses on the unique person in their unique situation. And the wise woman tradition is invisible because there is no visible structure. That's right. There's no, you know, papers that say, this is a certified wise woman because there are no certificates. There is no need for structure. In the wise woman tradition, no need for hierarchy. There is no difference between above and below. There is no order of authority. There is no sense that man is the ruler of all. And the wise woman tradition is invisible because uniqueness is invisible. Because commonness is invisible. Because prevention is truly invisible. And because one of the powers of the wise woman is invisibility. You know, if I suggest to a pregnant woman that she drink nettle infusion throughout her pregnancy, and then she gives birth and she doesn't hemorrhage, what I've done is invisible. She hasn't hemorrhaged because she's been drinking nettle, and so we don't see the hemorrhage. It's invisible. As a heroic healer, I could not mention that she could drink nettle, and she could hemorrhage at the birth, and then I could save the day and be the hero by coming in with shepherd's purse. And I'm certainly willing to do that. I'm not going to stand by her bed and blame her and shame her for not having drunk the nettle, but I'd rather do the invisible thing, which is true preventative medicine. True preventative medicine is invisible medicine because it is really pre Venting something rather than coming in and saving a day. My favorite midwives tell me that if after the birth the woman turns to them and thanks them, then they know that they have done something that they wish they hadn't done because their desire is always to be invisible to support, and only to support the process that is going on. If you're not driving, close your eyes again. And if you are driving, you can do these closed eyes exercises at home later on. Oh, what do we have there? We have our circle. There's our golden circle shining there. I would like you to take an eraser and erase a small part of that circle. Now take one end of it and begin to coil it around in a spiral, inside, inside, coiling around and coiling around. And then jump out and grab the other end, the loose end of that circle, and begin coiling that around and around the outside and around the outside. Now, I would like to ask you to find a place to stand in that spiral where you can't get out. Oh, you're right. You can always get out. You can never be locked in the spiral. You see, the spiral is very different than the circle. We could actually say that the circle is just a, a spiral that we haven't really seen in movement yet. And that, to me, is really part of what's going on in the scientific and the heroic traditions is to not moving that ineffable something that we lose when we take things apart. 
is not there in the scientific tradition. It's not there in the heroic tradition. It's that movement. It's that dynamic disequilibrium that the wise woman tradition offers us through nourishment. The heroic tradition talks an awful lot about balance, wanting to balance this and that, wanting to be in balance, wanting to balance our lives. And the truth of the matter is that balance is the step that immediately precedes death. We never, ever, ever want to be balanced because balance is static. Balance is breathe in and never breathe out. Oh, no, no, we want to be moving. I was just reading a really interesting article about heart rate variability. Now, if you go and you have, you know, someone take your pulse, they're going to say your heart is beating at, and then they're going to give you a number. They're going to say it's beating 60 times a minute or 90 times a minute or whatever it is, right? The truth of the matter is they probably didn't feel your pulse for a full minute, so they felt it for like 10 or 15 seconds and then just multiplied and rounded up. In fact, if we use very sophisticated uh, equipment that can really, you know, do that rounding up very quickly, like, you know, by measuring the space between two heartbeats and kind of round it up, then what we actually find is that it's not like the heart is beating like a metronome once every 60 seconds. Actually, we find that the healthier the person the more heart rate variability there will be. And heart rate variability is defined as the heart rate varying between two good normal heart rates. So the heart rate might vary between, like, say, 60 and 70 beats a minute. All right? Take the pulse for 15 seconds, we're going to round that. Oh, so you have a heart rate of 65. We get the sophisticated machinery on there. It can actually tell the heart rate is cycling back and forth between 60 and 70, five to seven times every minute. And the greater that heart rate variability, the greater the extremes that the the heart rate can vary to and remain healthy. And the more quickly it varies, the greater longevity of the person and the less likely they are to have any kind of heart disease. This is just one example of how our belief in fixity and how our belief in balance leads us astray when it comes to health. The scientific tradition, very much into fixity, right? The blood pressure should always be at a certain level. The cholesterol should always be at a certain level. But this is not how the human being operates. The heroic tradition, always looking for balance, balancing this against balancing that. But again, that's not how life operates. The heroic tradition, so afraid of life, so afraid of the fluid flow of life that moves back and forth and that is never, ever still. The spiral is never, ever still. The 13th step creates the spiral. 12 is the number of established order, easily divided and ordered, whereas 13 is the wild card, the unique number, the indivisible prime. 13 is a number of change. Healing with nourishment. Where did you get that idea, Susan? What a really weird idea. Well, I will admit, I am not a real big Bible girl. Also, I had some Baptist experiences as a child, and they did their best to really Bible me up. The parts that I've read, well, you know, it's like one of those books where you just read the beginning over and over, and you never get, like, very far into it. So I kind of know the beginning better than I know any other part. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I really think that in the beginning of the Bible, it says that we were created in the image of the Creator. Now, the creator, I think, is the image of perfection. And if we're created in the image of the creator, which is perfection, then we were created in perfection. And so I said to myself, I'm being told, and not just in the Bible, but in other places too, I'm being told that I am already perfect. What is in between me and my believing that? What is in between me and really, like, getting it that I'm perfect? 
hmm. And I thought about this little possibility. Suppose you came to visit me, and you said, well, Susan, I thought you said there were a lot of people coming to class today, but I don't see any seats here. And I said, you're so right. That hurricane swept them away, and we need more seats. So let you and I make some seats. Now, let's see. What are we going to use? Well, there's some boards in a pile over there. Well, the ends are kind of rotten, but we can saw this off. Here's the saw. It's true. I haven't had sharpened in a really long time, and some of the teeth are, well, they're broken. But, you know, I've got some masking tape on the handle here, and I think that should fix it. And uh, once we get it sawed, I guess we're going to need to, to hammer it together, and here's the hammer. Yeah, it's true. It's kind of chipped. But I got, you know, I got some, some tape on that, too, and that that'll hold together pretty good nails. You want some nails? Over in that can over there, I know it's filled with water, and the nails are bent and rusty, but you know we'll be able to make something for people to sit on. And isn't that the way that most people nourish themselves? They just kind of pick up whatever is at hand. And if it's not in good condition, well, they just kind of make do. Now, let's think of a different scenario in which I say, yes, indeed, we need some more seating. Here's a credit card. Let's go down to the local mall and buy some seating. Hmm. And we're probably going to come back with some much nicer stuff than we could make out of those old boards with the not good equipment and some pretty bad looking nails there. That credit card is nourishment. When we nourish ourselves, not just with what we put in our mouths, but what we put in our eyes and our ears, what we put in our skin, what we bring into our hearts, what we hold in our minds when we See that all things that come into us are part of what nourishes us and that what nourishes us becomes us, then we have a different question for ourselves. Do I want the evening news in my cell? No, I don't own a television. And the last thing I saw on TV was Kennedy's assassination because I don't want those things in myself. I teach outside because something different is in yourself when you are outside than when you are inside. Scientific study just came out, finds that people who exercise outdoors are healthier than people who do the same amount of exercise in We are nourished through all of our senses, and that includes our skin. The more that we receive optimum nourishment, the more pieces of our hologram come back, and the more clearly defined we are, the easier we find it to know what we want and what's good for us, too. I'm reminded of my apprentice, Belinda, who came to Talking Stick one morning, looked at me, and said, I hate you. Now, the shamanic apprentices are supposed to hate me. It's okay. That's kind of the way of it. And I was very curious, and always am, as to exactly what she had found to hate me for, because as each apprentice reveals what she hates about me, I, of course, learn ever so much about that apprentice. And what Belinda said she hated me for was that I made her M&Ms taste bad. And I thought, well, that's really a new one on me. I've never heard of that before. And she told me that she didn't realize that chocolate was a health food and that I was, of course, going to offer them plenty of chocolate. As a matter of fact, each apprentice group gets a five-kilo bar of dark chocolate for their six-week apprenticeship. There's usually four or five in um, a group, so that's a reasonable amount of chocolate for their time here. And so she brought some, mm, I won't even tell you the specific kind of candy, but it's a, a popular chocolate candy. And she had finished her first bag of it, and when she opened the second bag, she said the smell that rolled out of that bag made her want to heave. It was so bad. And she said, yes, just like that, in a mere eight days, eating real food, eating and drinking nourishing herbal infusions, picking wild salads, had so changed her body and her perceptions, and yes, no pepper of any kind in her diet, that suddenly artificial flavors and artificial colors weren't going to cut it with her anymore or her whole body was going to go, yuck, you can't expect me to eat that. 
As a matter of fact, for most people, simply getting the pepper out of their diet will restore their taste buds to the state where they can actually begin to tell which foods are beneficial for them and which foods aren't. I find that when people choose a deprived diet, like a vegan diet, a raw food diet, or most vegetarian diets, that they wind up using a lot of spices in their food, a lot of pepper, a lot of cayenne, a lot of strong curries and seasonings because their bodies are so desperately trying to tell them that they are not being nourished. The wise woman tradition then offers us ways to be nourished, certainly by what we eat, but perhaps more easily by drinking nourishing herbal infusions. I am a really big one on nourishing herbal infusions. And at the beginning of the month, I told you that one of the great delights of being older than 65 is that you can look back and see what good ideas you've had and that one of my good ideas is the three traditions of healing. Well, another one of my good ideas is to drink nourishing herbal infusions. On a daily basis, it costs you less than a dollar a day to get huge amounts of protein, few calories, amazing amounts of vitamins and lavish amounts of minerals, including trace minerals and minerals that we need in very, very tiny amounts. Nourishing herbal infusions are so important that every single one of my books talks about nourishing herbal infusions, whether it's my big green book, Healing Wise, which talks about the three traditions of healing. And if you're interested in learning more, you can find out more in Healing Wise or whether it's Wise Woman Herbal for the Childbearing Year, New Menopausal Years, The Wise Woman Way, Breast Cancer, Question Mark, Breast Health, Exclamation Point, The Wise Woman Way, or Down There, Sexual and Reproductive Health for Women and the Men They Love. You're going to be finding lots of information on the nourishing herbal infusions, one of the easiest, simplest, least expensive, and fastest ways to supercharge your health and find yourself with endless amounts of the energy. As a matter of fact, I have an online course called Drink Your Way to Health with Nourishing Herbal Infusions. One of the delights of the online courses is that it's a forum, so you can talk to the other students as well and see the experiences they're having. I love to drop by the forum and see the people writing in and saying, oh my goodness, my husband's been drinking these infusions for three weeks and he just came back from the doctor and the doctor said, well, you know, you don't have to take blood pressure medication anymore and, um, you know, you seem to be a lot healthier. What are you doing? Hmm. Well, invisible, isn't it? The wise woman tradition is an invisible way of nourishing the wholeness of the unique individual. If you enjoy the talks that I've been doing here, you might want to look into my DVD. And I have a DVD which in which I am giving a talk about the three traditions, but I'm also making nourishing herbal infusions and going out on my property and introducing you to some of the plants that I use. Now, I don't use fresh plants for the infusion. I use only dry plants. And so if you're saying, well, gee, I won't be able to do that, of course you can do that. It's very, very easy to do. You can also tootle on over to YouTube, and you will find lots of me in YouTube over there making nourishing herbal infusions and talking about the specific infusions and the specific things that you can get from it. Well, half an hour per tradition is kind of short, but we've done it, haven't we? We've spent half an hour looking at the scientific tradition, half an hour looking at the heroic tradition, and half an hour looking at the wise woman tradition. The wise woman tradition, which encourages us to use common local plants that are familiar, simple, messy, and fun to empower ourselves and all other life, to treat ourselves and all life with great love and compassion. This is Susan Weed, the voice of the wise woman tradition. 
I hope that you've enjoyed the time that we've spent together, and I thank you for opening your minds and your hearts to me and to this new idea about healing through nourishing the wise woman way. Remember, herbal medicine is people's medicine. Together, we have helped to reweave the healing flow of the ancient. Dream blessings, everyone. Thank you, Susan. That was so enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. This completes the fourth segment of our four-part series, The Three Traditions of Healing with Susan Weed at Sky Blue Symposia. 